Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, very uh, nice uh, uh, that a cryobiologist can be invited to a meeting on aging. Uh, but uh, as you just heard, I do have some interest in, uh, in aging as well, and we'll talk about that. In fact, I'll be talking to you about a treatment that we believe in some important ways can reverse uh, aspects of human aging right now. So uh, the problem that we set out to uh, address uh, was the problem of thymic involution. The thymus, uh, which is that uh, yellow organ uh, designated with the red arrow, uh, under your breastbone, just above your heart and the chest cavity, uh, is the master gland of your immune system. It is responsible for educating uh, uh, hematopoietic uh, uh, precursor cells that uh, uh, are, are converted into mature T cells, which comprise your adaptive immune system. Uh, the problem that we have is that uh, the thymus, uh, which is composed primarily of functional tissue when you're first born, undergoes this progressive uh, infiltration with fatty tissues. The functional part of the thymus is gradually replaced even as a teenager. By the time you get to be about 50 uh, years of age or so, it, you've replaced almost all of the functional mass of the thymus with uh, fat. Uh, unfortunately, because you need the thymus to generate new T cells, uh, the uh, involution of the thymus eventually leads to a depletion of competent T cells which leads to an immunodeficient state uh, related to aging, which we call immunosenescence. To give you an idea of what this means, uh, if you look at your T cell receptor repertoire, which is the sum total of all of the antigens your immune system can recognize, there's a collapse that takes place between about the ages of 60 and 80, in which you lose 98% uh, of your ability to recognize uh, foreign antigens. And unfortunately, this leads to death. Uh, so as you uh, become immuno-incompetent, uh, it's been possible to show that uh, your immune state can be correlated with your risk of death. So in the, in the uh, figure on the right, um, uh, there was a 80% uh, chance of death within two years for people that were uh, at a particular state of immune deficiency. So unfortunately, uh, the problem that we have is that thymic involution leads to loss of competent T cells and incompetent uh, T cells lead to death. So the goal was to reverse this. We like to reverse uh, uh, immunosenescence by reversing thymic involution. In other words, we want to regrow your thymus uh, so that you take that 50-year-old uh, thymus that's almost all fat and over time, we replenish more and more of the functional mass of that thymus. Uh, in the process, thereby hopefully coming back up this immune cliff that we're all destined to fall off if we take no other action, uh, and thereby uh, reversing the trend toward increased age-related mortality due to immunosenescence. So in pursuit of this goal, uh, we started, uh, Intervene Immune uh, started a uh, exploratory pre-phase one uh, uh, trial called the TRIM trial, which we uh, completed between 2015 and 2017. TRIM stands for Thymus Regeneration, Immunorestoration, and Insulin Mitigation. Uh, the aim was to regenerate the thymus in nine healthy 51 to 65-year-old men. And in order to appreciate the magnitude of the task that we set out for ourselves, I've put a little red box here on this diagram of the composition of the thymus with age. And you can see that in the uh, age range that we chose to attack, um, almost all of the thymus has been replaced by fatty tissue. Um, so we treated the men uh, for one year. Uh, in, in one case, uh, our first cohort, we were able to follow up with them uh, at 18 months. So that's six out of nine of the volunteers uh, had some follow up. Uh, the study was an open-label uh, study. It was approved by an IRB, uh, and it was also done under an uh, IND from the FDA. The uh, agents that we used to attempt to regenerate the thymus uh, consisted of human, a recombinant human growth hormone because of evidence in the literature that that is a, a, a thymotrophic agent or a thymus regenerating agent. Uh, and a combination of uh, DHEA and metformin because both of these, in the context of growth hormone treatment, uh, have anti-hyperinsulinemic effects. 
Uh, it was a collaborative effort. The study was largely based at Stanford uh, University, uh, but we also had collaboration from UCLA, particularly on the part of Steve Horvath, and also at the University of British Columbia. Uh, the endpoints of the study involved measuring about 36 different uh, immune cell antigens using this technique that they have at Stanford called CYTOF. It's a mass spectrometry approach. Uh, we also uh, looked at epigenetic age and a variety of other conventional endpoints. So as Hippocrates, uh, Hippocrates would say, uh, first do no harm. So uh, there's evidence in literature that high levels of IGF-1 might be associated with prostate cancer, so we were really concerned about the possible risk uh, in this trial of uh, exacerbating uh, the risk of prostate cancer, so we had a look at that uh, first and foremost. But what we found uh, is that the uh, PSA score, which is a, you know, an obvious uh, generic uh, indication of how you're uh, heading in terms of the risk of cancer, uh, improved uh, statistically significantly by day 15 of treatment and remained low thereafter. Uh, the other side of the PSA assay is the percent free PSA. You want your percent freeze to be high. And in fact, they went up within about 15 days to a statistically significant uh, level. So a combined uh, index uh, that, that factors both of these things in shows the same picture. We do have a spike in PSA uh, around six months, but uh, we think that that's because some of the guys in the trial were feeling pretty good and they uh, did not abstain from sexual activity when, right before they had their PSA drawn. Uh, but since that reversed, uh, it's obviously not a sign of impending cancer, it's definitely a sign of something else. So another concern that had been raised on the part of uh, one of the uh, biogerontologists that I uh, talked to about this trial before we did it was the fact that, as we all know, uh, aging brings with it this condition called inflammaging, or this uh, global increase in inflammation uh, that um, probably arises from uh, uh, all kinds of uh, reasons. But um, uh, we found uh, that even though uh, increasing, we, we were attempting to increase the function of the thymus, thereby increase the uh, activity of the immune system, which could have led to an increase in inflammation. We did not see an increase in inflammation. Uh, in fact, we saw a statistically significant decrease in the, at least the C-reactive protein as an index of inflammation. No change in IL-6. So another issue was, uh, it, is it really possible to regenerate the thymus in men of this age? Uh, there are some uh, concerns in the literature that uh, people in this age range don't even have any functional thymic mass uh, left, in which case there would be nothing to regrow and we would have been out of luck. But we found that we were able to regenerate the thymus in every case. Um, and this is an example of how the thymus looks in the uh, magnetic resonance uh, images that we uh, collected. Uh, a is uh, uh, one of the uh, volunteers' thymus uh, at uh, onset of the trial before any treatment, and B is what the thymus looked like nine months later. You can see that uh, overall the density of the thymus uh, uh, by MRI is increased, uh, which is a sign that you're replacing fatty uh, tissue with uh, functional mass in the thymus, thus uh, re reversing the normal process of thymic involution. So uh, we wanted to do more than just look at pictures, so we worked uh, with the head of radiology at Stanford to come up with this method of quantifying thymic fat. Uh, it's been uh, shown in bone marrow that this method actually can quantify the fat content of bone marrow uh, even more accurately than uh, histological examination uh, can, can uh, reveal. And uh, so again, we found that uh, nine out of nine of our guys increased uh, their uh, thymic uh, fat-free fraction. In other words, you measure the fat content of the thymus and then you subtract that from the total uh, signal that you get, uh, the water signal, and you end up with the fat-free uh, signal or the fat-free fraction of the thymus. Now we did have two outliers um, and I, I put a red box around them on the left uh, panel. Uh, they, for some reason, had a very high uh, fat-free uh, uh, fraction to start with. Not quite sure why. Uh, they were both kind of skinny, so that may be the reason. But uh, as indicated in the middle panel, uh, which we have uh, the list of their ages, uh, one of them was one of our youngest, and one of them was one of our oldest, and 
The green point is another one of our oldest, which showed one of the highest uh, uh, gains in uh, thymic cellularity. So this, uh, whatever this was that made these two people unusual, it was not age-related. Uh, so you can see that uh, in the middle panel, uh, we um, uh, show a few asterisks, which show that everybody else was statistically significant, even at five months. Uh, and overall, the statistical significance of this change in the thymus was less than, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 13th. So we're pretty confident that we have done something to the thymus. Uh, and as the diagram on the right shows, um, uh, the increase in the thymus uh, uh, fat-free uh, mass uh, is pro inversely proportional to the uh, amount of fat uh, 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 yeah, uh, fat-free uh, mass that you start with. In other words, if you have a fattier, more involuted thymus, that thymus has the biggest gains, which is kind of what you would want. Okay, so uh, we also, uh, as kind of as a control, we looked at the bone marrow uh, fat-free fraction. Uh, you need to have uh, uh, progenitor cells arise from the bone marrow, so we were hoping to see some improvements there. We did see some improvements there. You notice that the uh, the bone marrow does not involute like the thymus, so the fat-free fraction was higher to start with, and the gains were smaller, but they uh, were very statistically significant. And again, the fattier your, your bone marrow to start with, uh, the, the better uh, your uh, improvement was. Okay, so in terms of uh, immune cell population, uh, we did see an increase in the output of recent thymic emigrants of the CD4 uh, uh, lineage. We did see an increase in the naive uh, CD4 uh, uh, population and also in the naive CD8 uh, cell population. So this is really what you want to achieve. Uh, the immune system first generates naive T cells, which are cells that have not encountered uh, antigen yet. Uh, and those are the cells that have new um, contributions to make to the T cell repertoire. Uh, so we, we did, we were able to document improvements in, in all of that, as well as recent thymic immigrants. Now, one of the things we weren't really anticipating was kind of interesting, uh, and that was that we saw a reduction uh, in PD-1 expression on CD8 T cells. And it turns out that's actually pretty important, potentially, because it's known both in mice and in humans that uh, this particular population of cells represents exhausted T cells. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, PD-1 itself is a checkpoint uh, inhibitor that uh, participates in the inability of the immune system to recognize and destroy cancer. And as a result of that, drugs have been developed like Optivo, which is the number seven of all drugs that is a PD-1 inhibitor market for Optivo has uh, been $6.7 billion a year as of uh, last year. And Keytruda uh, operates on the other side of that on the PD-1 uh, uh, ligand. Uh, and that's the number third uh, drug in terms of uh, income per year. And each one of these uh, drugs uh, costs $150,000 a year for the patient being treated with them. Uh, but we can uh, achieve a similar effect, it looks like, uh, with a treatment that costs less than 10% of that uh, amount. So in t and, uh, another thing that we saw in terms of efficacy, which we actually were not expecting at all, in fact, I never really even heard of this before uh, we analyzed our data, just kind of fell out of the data, is uh, the, we saw this increase in the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio. Uh, and looking into this, it turns out that if your lymphocyte monocyte ratio is higher, then you have improved outcomes for eight different kinds of cancers uh, or uh, reduced uh, likelihood of contracting those cancers in the first place. As you can see, the uh, lymphocyte to monocyte ratio increase was quite statistically significant and quite consistent. Uh, and there's a couple different ways of calculating it. We'll get into that later. but. Uh, it's a really interesting observation, particularly because that's not all that's associated with a high lymphocyte to monocyte ratio. Uh, this ratio uh, is also correlated with improvements in inflammation, atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke, and all-cause mortality. So in other words, uh, the lymphocyte monocyte ratio, for some reason that nobody's ever explained to my knowledge, 
it seems to be uh, an index uh, of, of your likelihood of resisting all of the killer diseases of aging, or certainly a good number of them. And as, just as one example, um, I've got this red line drawn on the uh, diagram at a lymphocyte to monocyte ratio of five, because according to the literature, if you're below five, you have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, heart disease in particular, and uh, if you're above that ratio, you're protected. And all of our guys on average were below five at the onset of the trial, and they are all well above five at the conclusion of the trial. And you'll notice that that also persisted six months after the end of the trial out to 18 months. So um, uh, why is the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio going up? Well, it's going up because, mostly because the monocyte population is going down. So what you see on the left is uh, the percentage uh, of uh, monocytes in general without respect to any sort of subpopulation of monocytes. And what you see on the right is uh, specific uh, to the CD38 positive monocyte pool. Uh, both of them go down with high statistical significance and both of them stay down uh, six months after the trial. So we think that's significant. Uh, so. Uh, because it, uh, it turns out that monocytes uh, express CD38. Almost all monocytes, let's say 80% or more of monocytes, express CD38. And CD38 is an ectoenzyme that destroys NAD and also uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, which is a precursor to NAD. And uh, there is paper which has uh, indicated uh, very powerfully that, surprisingly, um, the depletion of tissue NAD with aging is due to uh, expression of CD38 on inflammatory cells that are in the tissues. And the paper did not identify what those inflammatory cells are, but it's possible that uh, one of those inflammatory cells is, uh, is the monocyte. Um, so if that's true, uh, then perhaps the reason that uh, uh, the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio is important is that uh, low levels of monocytes uh, result in higher NAD levels in the tissue. Now this is wild speculation, I've got nothing to back this up, so take that into account, but uh, the, it kind of fits the data. Um, and we know that if you restore NAD levels in mice, you rejuvenate many aspects of aging within about a week. And so maybe increasing the lymphocyte monocyte ratio uh, does uh, something similar to that. And the reason that we think that it may really be important that it's monocytes uh, is that we didn't see any other CD38 positive immune cell population going down uh, with our treatment. Only the monocytes did that. This may be why people have been able to correlate good outcomes with the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio as opposed to the lymphocyte to something else ratio. Um, as to why the monocytes, uh, you know, would respond in this way, uh, you know, again, all I can do is speculate. Uh, a high lymphocyte to monocyte ratio is associated with uh, low states of inflammation, and we did see evidence that we actually reduced inflammation uh, as a result of our treatment. So there may be, uh, that may be one reason uh, for this uh, phenomenon. And just to add a little bit more uh, support to that, um, it's been seen before that there's a relationship between the thymus and global aging process or generalized aging processes that, in other words, non-immune uh, aspects of aging. Uh, in other words, thymus transplants reverse many aspects of aging. And I'll just uh, show you this slide, uh, uh, which is, uh, compiled from several different studies, uh, all assembled in one slide. So what you're seeing is uh, the, the lighter bars are what happens to you in aging, if you're a mouse at least, uh, and uh, the vertical line is where you should be if you're a young mouse as opposed to an old mouse. And the uh, darker shaded bars are what happens to a mouse uh, after you give that mouse a thymus transplant in old age. So uh, what you see is that uh, uh, plasma thi uh, thyroid hormone levels are normalized, uh, brain beta cell, uh, uh, beta receptor populations are normalized, uh, plasma insulin levels are normalized, the number of uh, tetraploid uh, uh, hepatocytes uh, is returned back down to 
almost nothing. Uh, you're, you're back to diploid hepatocytes. In other words, for some strange reason, the transplantation of the thymus is allowing cells in the, in the liver to divide as they should. Uh, and uh, uh, d DNA synthesis stimulated by beta cell uh, uh, signaling is also restored. And on the right uh, is, a, is a, a, a figure that's uh, copied from a, a paper showing that thymus transplants, serial thymus transplants, may be able to actually extend the lifespan. So uh, we saw another sign that maybe our treatment was having effects on global aging processes. Uh, because we, for one thing, we saw an improvement in renal function, which wasn't really expected, but as you can see, the estimated uh, glomerular filtration rate increased uh, statistically uh, by 9 and 12 months and seemed to be on an upward trend even at uh, 18 months, six months after the trial ended, although with only six guys in that population, we couldn't really prove it, uh, but the overall trend is significant. This, uh, in addition to being a, a clue as to what our, uh, our treatment is actually accomplishing, uh, may have some other significance. In 2010, uh, the government has this uh, thing called the End Stage Renal Disease uh, Program, or the ESRD. Uh, they spent uh, $34 billion on it in, in 2011, uh, which is 6% of the budget of Medicare. So if we could dent the age-related tendency toward uh, renal functional impairment, it could be significant. Another sign uh, of per perhaps sort of non-immune aspects uh, improving uh, was a couple of the guys uh, came to us and said that uh, they seemed to notice that their hair was growing in uh, darker again. Uh, this is the most dramatic guy and the only guy that we could actually document, but uh, his wife, you know, was saying, what's going on with you? Your hair is you're turning dark again. So uh, it's an anecdote, you know, it didn't apply to most of the guys. But it, it's a sign that maybe something really interesting is going on. So uh, if you think that maybe uh, your treatment has a general effect on aging, what's the real best way to measure that? Well, I think we would all tend to agree that one of the best ways is to use the epigenetic uh, clocks that have been put out there. So uh, we collaborated with Steve Horvath, and uh, we use as our primary clock the, the Horvath uh, DNA methylation aging clock. Uh, and uh, fortunately, you've all heard a lot about the, uh, uh, these clocks uh, from Morgan Levine uh, uh, yesterday, uh, so I don't have to go into detail about that. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that you can assess uh, the effect of your uh, treatment on aging using an epigenetic clock. The way uh, Steve likes to do it is just take all of the data points and put them on a big scattergram and uh, correct everything for the age at the, at the time that you make the measurement, and that's called uh, linear mixed model analysis, or LMMA. Uh, and if you do that uh, for the first 12 months of treatment, uh, uh, you get a very strong p-value. Um, and if you do it uh, for the whole 18-month uh, period of time, which is uh, uh, incorporating uh, the uh, end of the treatment time, uh, you still get a significant p-value. Um, I wanted to come up with a, a, a technique for sort of isolating the treatment effect more specifically than that. So what we did is we subtracted out the baseline age acceleration, as, as Steve would call it, which is the difference between the epigenetic age and the actual chronological age before treatment, or EA minus A0, um, and then uh, use that as your baseline and look at the difference between that and the difference between your epigenetic age and your chronological age thereafter. So that's, that gives you this so-called age acceleration due to the treatment per se, and that's what we've uh, plotted on this graph. So this was a pretty interesting result. Um, to my knowledge, this has not been demonstrated in any mammal before. Um, but we wanted to see if it was uh, corroborated by any other clock, as we heard on uh, 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 yesterday. Um, the clocks uh, measure somewhat different things. Uh, sometimes they don't agree with each other very well. So we also looked at the Hannum clock, uh, the Levine clock, also known as the Pheno age clock, and the Grim age clock. And uh, they all showed the same thing. Uh, the shapes are a little bit different. Uh, the p-values are slightly different, but they all show the same trends. We see an improvement in epigenetic age by nine months, and we see a bigger improvement uh, by 12 months. And depending upon the clock, uh, we see more and more persistent changes 
in the gains uh, after the end of treatment. The, gr <coughs> the grim age clock being our best one, uh, giving us uh, essentially a steady state uh, improvement in uh, epigenetic age. Uh, now, you may have noticed in those other four diagrams that uh, the improvement after nine months of treatment was not uh, uh, quite as strong as the treatment after 12 uh, months. In other words, there was an increase in slope between the uh, zero to nine month period and the nine to 12 month period. And so we decided this is actually the average of, um, of all of the uh, clocks. Uh, and uh, using that average, you can see that uh, the difference in the slopes uh, is statistically significant, which means that uh, whatever this uh, is that we're doing, it's, it's, it's accelerating as, as we prolong the treatment. Uh, so uh, the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio looks kind of like the inverse of the grim age clock. Uh, we want to mention that the grim age clock predicts human life expectancy. So for the grim age clock to show a reversal of about two years means that our guys in theory would be predicted to have a two-year increase in their predicted life expectancy. It also predicts health expectancy. So it has not escaped our notice, you might say, um, that there's this, been this concept out there called the longevity escape velocity, uh, in which for every uh, year of uh, time that goes by, you're able to reverse aging by a year so that there's no net change in your biological uh, age. We seem to have achieved something a little bit better than that after one year of treatment, we're, we're minus 1.5 years, or compared to no treatment, uh, uh, compared to normal aging, we're better by two and a half years. Very briefly, um, uh, all of our guys at baseline uh, had uh, epigenetic ages that were younger uh, than their chronological age, but we found no correlation between uh, outcomes uh, epigenetically and that uh, baseline state. In other words, it doesn't matter how young you are epigenetically, you still can benefit from this treatment. And there's no correlation with your age uh, uh, at entry into the trial, your A0. So regardless of how old you are, at least within the uh, parameters of this very small trial, uh, you're able to benefit. Now, of course, we have to have some caveats about this. This is a small trial. It has not yet been replicated. And none of our guys has actually lived two years longer than expected, and I'm not real eager to find out, you know, if they're going to do that, because I want them to keep on living much longer. But uh, I also have to say uh, epigenetic aging is not a, uh, identical to aging itself. For example, it does not take into uh, account the telomer clock, which is a separate clock, um, although it's a pretty good measure. And we don't have any data yet for women. But we do hope to address some of these uh, questions. Uh, we're working on setting up an IRB-approved uh, uh, series of observational trials uh, in the Palm Springs area. Uh, the physician in charge of those trials will be Joe Sugar. Uh, Joe is one of our original volunteers. Uh, he was uh, one of the guys who was submitting himself to thymus regeneration treatment, and he's willing to help us explore uh, extending that to other people, uh, and we'll do that with IRB approval. We'd like to do some fundraising to help out with this, but if necessary, we'll arrange for this to be volunteer-funded. Meanwhile, we have a paper uh, that's uh, about to be accepted, I think, uh, for publication. Uh, but since it's not yet published, I mean, uh, except that I won't mention the journal name. So thanks for listening. Uh, you can contact me or uh, the CEO, Bobby Brook, uh, or our CFO, uh, uh, Paul uh, Hynek, uh, at interveneimmune.com. And uh, the guy on the, on the uh, other side of the slide there is Steve Horvath. He's our great friend and collaborator, but I uh, ask you not to bother him because he's very busy. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.